Welcome to the Loco Digital Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Richard McGurr. I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Josiah Adams. Hello, everyone. And today we have a very special guest on the podcast. Today we have Todd Bryan, Managing Partner of Velotech Strategy. Velotech advises corporates in transforming their revenue models and customer relationships towards recurring revenue. Good to have you on, Todd. Thank you, Richard. Happy to be here. Great. So, um, yeah, wh- why don't you uh, start by kind of, you, you have something that you call XAAS yeah. a- as kind of the core theory of your business. Why don't, why don't you de- define that and then tell us how you um, implement that for these companies? So XAAS is a billion-dollar word for really just saying leasing. You have mm-hmm. the right to use a product as long as you pay. Mm-hmm. And you don't have full ownership of it, but you have the right to use. So if you think about it, this model goes all the way back to a tenant farmer in the Middle Ages in Europe. If you couldn't afford to buy the land, you lease the land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so XAS is just used to try to capture all the different variations of AAS that we saw you know, blow up over the last several years. So we first had SAAS, Software as a Service. Mm-hmm. Then people started saying Platform as a Service, mm-hmm. Infrastructure as a Service. Really, all they are is a business model. So that's, that's an interesting point. So for, from your point of view, which is the strategy, the difference between PaaS, YAS, SaaS, all that, really doesn't matter because what you've done is you're just saying I'm I'm I have a recurring transaction with a company and it's a lease. Absolutely. And it's a recurring relationship with the customer. This is yeah. a transformation from a transactional type of relationship with a customer to a recurring relationship with a customer. That is what is critical and central to this beyond the leasing model. Yeah. And so you you actually have a very impressive background that makes you an authority on this um, so wh- why don't you tell tell us a bit about that? I believe one of the most famous, uh, one of the most well known in the tech industries transfers from a, uh, I guess uh, a transactional one sales model to, uh, in this case it was cloud, and I believe it. In, you probably know how much. Yeah, well, just go ahead and tell everybody. <laughs> sure. So just a background of my career, I combine uh, strategy consulting together with corporate strategy executive experience. And I've done this mostly in the tech industry, but actually across a variety of different industries. In fact, most recently, I was a strategy executive with a company that makes light bulbs, Phillips Lighting, Mm -hmm. and helped with the transformation both to an XAAS business model as well as IoT. And before that was... Before that was Adobe. Yes. I was a corporate strategy executive with Adobe and worked on the transformation to Creative Cloud. You may have heard of this. Yeah, you may have heard of it. It, yeah. it was uh, controversial when it started, but it turned out to be fantastic. Yeah. And could you tell us a bit more about what was controversial with that and, and what challenges Adobe had to take to... Well, what was... Yeah, why did they want to do... I think even start deeper. Why did they want to do it? And then, yeah, tell, tell a bit of that story. There are two sides to this. So first of all, why did Adobe want to do this? But why was this right for Adobe customers? Because I say mm. it's a bit controversial... I was talking to somebody about this the other day. There were some complaints from customers at first when we made this change. Those went away after about two or three months. They were gone. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of concern about this. So if you look at it from the customer perspective, and let's remember, that's where you start, right? You don't do these things just because they're fun for you. You do them because customers like them, and they will consume more of what you produce, Mm -hmm. and they will become more loyal to you. And maybe, maybe just in case you've been living under a rock, uh, Adobe makes uh, media production software. Creative software. Yeah, Creative yeah. software. And that previously they sold a bundle that was... Several different bundles. There was, you know, the high end was Master Series. Uh-huh. So What did that cost? I it could go anywhere from three to $5,000, depending on the version. One-time purchase. Per license. One-time purchase. Per license. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you think about that. Let's put it in the customer perspective. That's a lot of money, right? How many people have three to five thousand dollars lying around? They're just going to drop on software. Yeah, some big corporation, sure, but we're talking about creatives here. Well, what are most creatives? Most creatives are small businesses. So if you're selling, or even freelancers, and freelancers, yeah. yeah. So if you're selling this product at three to five thousand dollars, you're automatically defining a certain subset of a market that can actually purchase your product. So what the smallest happens? subset, arguably, in their smallest. case, yeah, yeah. And so people are looking at this and saying it's not affordable. So that, that's not good for them. They can't enjoy access to the latest version of the software. Also, when something is priced at that level, 
this becomes a real problem, think of it. You're working in a company, and who hasn't gone through this? It actually is even working in a large corporation. Mm -hmm. You decide you need an IT tool or you need some software or something. You go through the company purchasing portal. You go in there. You have to request it, and what happens? An automatic message goes to your boss. It's like, saying, I want to spend $5,000. I want to spend $5,000. How mm -hmm. embarrassing is that? It's like, oh, my God, I clicked this button. I'm going to get fired. You know, it's, <laughs> you don't want to go through this. You move to a subscription model, 50 bucks a month. Now you put that on a corporate card. Mm -hmm. You don't oh, even yeah, have to hand you in have a signature. Receipt. Yeah, yeah, you can just say, like, oh, yeah. I've got a monthly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it's cheaper. I mean, more people can now afford it. It's easier to actually get it in your hands. You don't have to, you know, get embarrassed and potentially in front of your boss. Then finally, another great thing is, is you're always using the latest, greatest version. There's mm -hmm. no version issue. And new tools that are coming out all the time. Yeah, new tools are always, you know, constantly coming out. So, and in the creative world, this is a major issue. If I'm working on something that's a photograph or a video or whatever, and I've done it in three, and then I send it to somebody who's got five, and he edits it and sends oh, it yeah. back to me yeah. in three. Compatibility mode. Now you've got a real serious problem. So you want everybody using the latest version so they get the greatest value out of it. Mm -hmm. So from the customer perspective, this actually turned out to be a no-brainer. From the company perspective, that's the one, obviously, internally, I was thinking most about. I mean, it's incredible what, what the XAS model does. It creates very predictable recurring revenue streams, but it also makes your costs very, very predictable. Uh, so Todd, um, can you tell us more about the kind of companies that this kind of a, as a service model applies to? So I actually tried to find an example of an industry where this wouldn't work. And the reason why is you look at what are some of the more famous as-a-service offerings that we've had over the last few years? Sure, it's software, but also it's Dollar Shave Club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, show, they sell razors. Yep. I mean, if you can convert shaving products into as-a-service, you can convert anything into as-a-service. And by the way, Dollar Shave Club went from being some guys who were really frustrated that at the grocery store they had to press the little button to get the security to come over to open the thing so they could actually buy their razors. They said, no, we'll just get somebody to make them for us and send, us to, send them to us. That happened to me this week. Yeah, it, it's annoying. It, it literally right. threw well, me that's off what from their the ad purchase. Was. I was like, I'm not getting, I need, exactly. I need my fusion blades. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> if I can't <laughs> grab them now, I got places to go. It's a holiday. Like, well, yeah. Unilever ended up paying, I think it was $2 billion in cash for them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't shares, it was cash. A big win for the uh, Los Angeles startup scene, by the way. Yeah. Debated by Science Inc. Mm. Yeah, mm. L.A., baby. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a great example where this works. I, I kept picking my brain like, well, there's got to be an industry. So I thought, well, healthcare has got to be a place where this just doesn't really work. No, it does work there. I mean, healthcare, the reason being, you've got such a convoluted flow between vendor and actual end user with so many deciding parties in it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the case. You actually can do things like subscribe to diabetes uh, equipment. Oh, you mean uh, the end, end user? Testing. End end user, the actual person mm -hmm. who's getting the value out of it. Uh -huh. um, and so I thought, well, what about mining machinery? I did a project on mining machinery like, I don't know, what was it, 30 years ago when I was a little kid? Mm. <laughs> so think about it. You go into a coal mine. What do they have in there? They have these things called long wall miners. It's basically this gargantuan yep. truck with an arm on the yep. front and a wheel. And it just does this and goes back and forth in the coal seam. Well, what happens to the coal seam behind it after it's done getting the coal out? It collapses. Mm -hmm. So these things get buried in a coal mine. I'm like, how do you subscribe to something that gets buried in a coal mine? You know, you can't, uh, guess what? Well, you don't subscribe necessarily to the miner. You subscribe to the value-added services created by IoT. Coal mining is dangerous, right? Oh, yeah. Um, you've got to be monitoring air levels. You've got to be monitoring the quality of the seam. You've got to be monitoring uh, temperature. You've got to be monitoring um, you know, you know, how, how, what type of coal it is, et cetera, in order to be more uh, efficient on the uh, downstream end once you get it out. I mean, all these things can be measured by putting sensors on the coal mining machinery. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an old adage, don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle. Mm. Okay, so what you do is, is you create a package of value-added services on top of 
buying the actual coal mining machinery. The reality is, is that you may actually sell the coal mining machinery at a, as a loss leader. Mm-hmm. In other words, you're not making a profit on the sale. You make all the money back on the subscription services, which are all these monitoring right. things, the whole plus ecosystem. automation. And then you create an app platform. So then you create an ecosystem. And basically, that's just selling real estate. You're selling people access to the customer base. Mm-hmm. So I looked at it, and I, I thought, there's no way this is happening out there. Nobody, Yeah, sure enough, somebody's doing this. Uh, you can subscribe to a variety of different services from the coal mining machinery manufacturer if you buy one of their one of their miners, and it's a lot cheaper this way. Wow. And so I finally thought, you know what? There's no way you could subscribe. My girlfriend actually came up with this. She said, toilet bowl brushes. There's no way you can subscribe to a toilet bowl brush. Well, guess what, folks? On Amazon, you can subscribe to toilet bowl brushes. I'm not kidding. Subscribe and save. Mm -hmm. It's there. Praise to Bezos. (laughs) It's (laughs) we're not worthy. (laughs) But you know what? Let's let's go back again and think about what the convenience is for the customer. You would think what a ripoff, right? Somebody's going to subscribe to toilet bowl brushes. Wrong. How great is it that you don't have to think Mm -hmm. about buying your next toilet bowl brush? Because they have like a life cycle. Shows up. They Mm -hmm. have like a life cycle. They have a life cycle. Everything has a life cycle. So think about it. Somebody has taken that worry off of my hands. That's one of the beautiful things about this model for the customer again. They don't have to think. You, you think about, you know, you can subscribe to the iPhone in North America mm-hmm. through AT&T. Yep. Mm-hmm. You can actually subscribe to the iPhone. And you don't have to wait in line. You don't have to think about, gee, you know, do I want to go for are the Are the features good enough? I, no, it just shows up. How easy is that? How convenient is that? Same thing with something like the Creative Cloud. Same thing like wow, you know, any hardware product you have that can carry software and services on top of it, those things show up automatically. How wonderful is that? I didn't have to think. And I'm not saying turning you into a robot or automating you What I'm sa- as a consumer or as a business. What I'm saying is, is it's taking a lot of inconvenience off your hands. And by the way, there is a lot of value in that. Anytime I studied this, there is tremendous value when people say, yeah, I don't have to think about making a purchase decision. There's much more to this, you were saying. Yeah. Uh, one of the key things is is that in when someone's buying the perpetual product, and that's what we call the ownership product, meaning the master series or something like that. Oh, uh, you mean the buy once. The buy once. Perpetual. And perpetual is kind of a nice catchphrase to that because you enjoy perpetual rights to the use of that product. Yeah, okay. Um, think about the flow between the vendor and the actual end user. Again, it could be this thing where there's a boss in there giving an approval. It has to go through finance. It might have to go through an IT department to approve whether or not mm-hmm. it could be used on the system. It might go through, God, who knows how many different groups within the company. Well, when you move to something like a creative cloud or some other type of a recurring revenue product, your user is often the decider mm-hmm. and is also the person who's paying because they're putting it on their corporate card, and that corporate card doesn't have to go through any approval process. You don't even need a receipt most of the times below a certain limit. Be- because you've you've uh, made the specific transaction under a certain dollar. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know who, who learned this first was Salesforce.com. Mm. And mm-hmm. this is where they were so brilliant. For the longest time, Salesforce.com did not have an enterprise sales team. They didn't need one. Well, they didn't actually. Uh, I've, I've read the book by their head of sales where they actually thought that they were a small business CRM, whereas now, uh, if you're familiar with the CRM market, it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> where uh, it's like if you're a small business, it's yeah. it's not for you. Yeah. yeah it's too a, well, it, I mean, it could work for both. I mean, I've used it before as a small business. Well, But but anyway, to get, get to the, the story, which is great, I mean, their whole sales approach was guerrilla sales. Yeah, It was infiltration. What they did is instead of marketing to the IT or the purchasing department at a company, instead they said, no, 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 we're going to go straight to the salespeople. And since our price point is such that these people can put this product on their corporate card, you know, all these people with all these different salespeople at these companies started deploying Salesforce.com. Mm-hmm. Well, right. then the IT department's like, hey, wait wait a minute here. All you guys are using that. We didn't approve this. And yep. they said, if you cut that off, I quit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and if you want to hear more about this, the book that we're but you can actually learn a lot about this story. Uh, a book was written by Aaron Ross called Predictable Revenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, if you're sales or sales adjacent, 
Yeah, it's a good read. It's a good read. But this is how, you know, Adobe changed what it did as well. Instead of marketing Master Suite and Creative Suite to um, the IT departments or the purchasing departments or whatever, you go straight to the end user. Yep. Yeah. Now that whole flow of decision making is just collapsed. Right. Wow. So so I imagine there's more benefits that comes from this model than just the expansion of the market. Uh, what other key benefits could a business expect from moving to this uh, recurring and subscription-based model? Well, there was that predictability point that we talked about earlier, and that's critical because partially what that does is, is it really it, it lowers your costs because you don't have to have spikes in headcount and spikes mm -hmm. in spending. One of the things I don't, elab don't elaborate on so much but is also a really good point as you think about it you your sales team changes now this is more of a challenge for a lot of people than it is what i would call an easy opportunity you mm -hmm. have to go through a bit of a cultural shift because your sales team goes from being hunters to being gatherers and what that means is they're not out there trying to get big fish big whales instead they're trying to pick up all the little pieces and keep them together is that really an either or so let's say i'm out there and i'm selling master suite and i'm trying you know typical you sell it to sony pictures I'm selling it to yeah. Sony Pictures. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling it to Jim Bob's web design. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not worth my time or my effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, you start going to something like Creative Cloud. Now what you're really trying to do is, is you're trying to gather up as many units as you can as a salesperson. You're not worried so much about finding one big fish. Mm -hmm. You're realizing there's a lot of money to be made in just gathering up a bunch of different customers. Mm -hmm. Well, the other beauty of this is, is that you can automate a lot of this. And a lot of it becomes a marketing direct. thing. Yeah, 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 which is kind of the implication right. of automation. It becomes automation. A, s a systematized. Yeah, like they this. visit, yeah. they see this ad, they visit this landing page, mm -hmm. and then they get this second yep. ad, yep. and then they self-service and buy the license. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the beauties of moving to something like Creative Cloud was that it also enabled Adobe to start selling direct. Now, Adobe, of course, has a very well-known brand and a very good market position for the product that it offers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would make you say, well, it'd be pretty easy to pull people directly to adobe.com. Well, the reality was is back when it was packaged software, most of that got sold through Amazon. So that's mm -hmm. yet another step between you and the customer. Mm -hmm. And so and margin <laughs> and margin, but who is going to control the information flow in a relationship when you've got Amazon in the middle? Mm -hmm. Always Amazon. Amazon. Why not? They should. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's to their obvious self-interest, yeah. We found that you can save tremendous amounts of money by going direct to the customer. And the joke that we would tell in Adobe is, is you know, we were not a joke. We looked at it and we said, look, we need to get costs and control. And someone said, well, what did Dillinger say? Dillinger said that, you know, why, someone asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've heard well, that. Well, we said, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go after sales and marketing. That oh, because, I, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the reason I have a Creative Cloud license, is that, like, when I want to make a, uh, a graphic for this show, you know, I have my uh, Illustrator template, and then I replace the subtitle and the title. And, you know, if you work out, yeah, I think, I think you know where I'm, I'm going with this. It's not, I'm not a designer or anything like that but that I have to produce creatives. But but also to save our own money, we were going to go after our sales and marketing budgets. Uh -huh. And by getting this collapsed decision flow, this collapsed relationship flow directly from vendor to customer, you take out a lot of cost. You also have less need for um, quoted salespeople. Instead, what happens is, is all this gets automated through the web portal. Yeah, I was, I was going to add that I was like a salesperson isn't a small business gatherer, that there's better ways to they do that. They generally don't like to do that. Well, it's not the right tool for the job. Yeah, it's not the right tool for the job. Yeah. And so suddenly, boom, you've got a lot of the sales op uh, automated. You don't have to do marketing around new releases because everybody's just going straight to this uh, subscription product. It takes out a lot of costs. But that also, uh, I think... In your own experience, that's also a, an issue because I think the salespeople aren't, uh, you know, blind and deaf. No, they're not. And l let's be real. You you have to respect that that, you know, usually I put this down. I put this down in the opportunity category as well as I say, okay, this is when I'm talking to companies like I'm looking forward for you. You're going to have a problem here and understandably so because you're going to say, well, I'm going to try and cut our sales and marketing expense. It's like, 
oh, yeah, thanks a lot, you know? Yeah, the salespeople <laughs> are like, this is never going to work. Yeah, the, it's, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. That's what they always say. No, that, that's not the way this market works. It's all relationship-based. Okay, that's true. And I'm not advocating saying going out and firing all your salespeople and automating all of it. There's still a role for that. Well, and but I was yeah, going to say gonna that's be a resistance pocket. It's not an either or. I was kind of getting at that. Is that Sony Pictures yep. is still a major account? Absolutely. And I was going to. The reason why I say not either or is that I'm not a big fan of offering the perpetual alongside the subscription. And the reason yeah. being is this confusion point. Well, I totally agree with that. Yeah. You confuse everybody. You confuse your investors. You confuse your customers. You confuse your own employees. I mean, I think that the, the classic marketing case study is that, like, fast food restaurants, uh, when they go from, like, five to 20 items, a lot of people just walk out. They blow up. Yeah, yeah. They're just well, like, look at In-N-Out Burger. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, go to the go to the website for Salesforce.com. You'll see the most beautiful thing there. When you go look at the product page for the flagship CRM product, mm -hmm. my gosh, they offer you four packages. How easy can that be? Right. So, so if I'm a business that has not adopted these principles yet, and I'm on a transaction basis, mm -hmm. the more uh, traditional model, why is it that I have hesitation to go all in with this recurring model? Yeah, what are my concerns and fears? There are a lot, and they're understandable. Uh, the first is, is that, you know, frankly, if you get this wrong, it's not very pretty. Um, it can really blow up on you. Especially if you cut off your old product line, as you're suggesting. Exactly. I mean, I've worked with businesses that were very low margin, but, you know, as I put it, they were very fragile, but very finely tuned business models. Mm -hmm. You don't have a whole lot of flexibility to start messing with that. And if you start tinkering with it and it doesn't go right, then you've got problems. So you want some, you want an avenue to be able to experiment with this. And low code is one way to be able to do that. I mm. mean, you basically have the opportunity to experiment, try different things without spending immense amounts of money on new IT development. Mm. And you can be very quick with it too. You can trial and then cease the trial if you right. want. So I can tell you from experience, it is really hard when you go to a company that for 100 years has, you know, l let's think about how most companies operate if they're product companies. And mm -hmm. a product, you know, you can do product as a service all the time. Um, you go to a product company, they say, look, for 100 years, this is how our business is run. We take inputs, we add value, we sell it, we gain back all the money immediately. Mm -hmm. That's our gross margin, then we pay off our expenses with that, and then we've got net profit. Mm -hmm. And then cash flow out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You then go to somebody and say, no, 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 wait a minute. I want you to try this. Okay. We're going to spread that revenue out over five years. They're going to say, okay, who's going to finance that for me? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Who's going to do that? And that is where you hit the brick wall. And understandably so. Because a lot of companies, particularly product companies in commodity areas, that's, that's a lot to ask them to do. They're like, look, we don't grow like crazy. So telling us that, you know, we're always on a real tight margin, telling us to spread that margin out over five years, are you mm. nuts? So, Todd, you talked about how, on one hand, as a company's moving into a subscription or recurring revenue-based model, you don't want to have a conflict of so many different options where you have the old model and the new model, salespeople are confused, customers yeah. are confused. But on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of risk involved in going all in. Yes. Uh, with this. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the sources of this risk and what companies can do to manage this transition? It, so one thing i like to make clear, I don't think the risk, believe it or not, is on the customer side. If you put a good mm -hmm. offer in front of a customer, they will take it. Agreed. And so the resistance that I've so often heard from companies about going to an AAS model for anything is, well, my, my, you know, the market's not ready for this. As customers a don't service. Want it. As, a yeah. As a service, yeah. Yeah, it's the, but what about the finance angle? The finance angle is tough because you're basically deferring cash flows. But the way that you work around this is, is that you can do what I call the hybrid model, which is the hybrid uh, perpetual plus subscription model. Let's take an example. I used to work for Philips Lighting, uh, now called Signify has a really awesome set of IoT offerings for lighting and also some AAS models. Lighting yeah, my house service. is filled with these oh, lights. Oh, it's true. He's yes, got, like, thank you. Go. Yeah. Oh, man. Yes, thank I, you. I have about 100 of these light bulbs. I'm 
delighted to hear that. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and a big shout out to all my friends back at Phillips Lighting that are sitting there going, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know they're there. Um, but think about it. You, you sell the hardware, yes. But if you have incremental services that you can offer on top of the, so- uh, on top of the hardware, if you have something enabled by IoT and connectivity, your customer is invariably going to get more value out of those new services enabled by the new features in your hardware. Yeah. You're able to quantify, if you're good at your marketing, if you're good at your product development, you know how much that incremental value is to your customer. You've tested it. You've interviewed them. You've surveyed them. You've gotten a good sense of, okay, they generally see this as my previous product without the extra features was $100. Now they see it as worth to them, 200. It's not how much would you pay because nobody ever tells the truth of that question, by the way. It's, yeah, it's we worth We work 200. in software, yeah, yeah. we're familiar. Yeah, no, yeah, nobody Especially ever, custom uh, software. Yeah, nobody ever says <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What's <laughs> your budget on this, <laughs> by <Yeah>. the way? <laughs> it's the worst question in the planet, right? I mean, it's, it, nobody ever answers that, honestly. So you've got an, $100 of incremental value, roughly. You know, you want to take into account the cost side of this. I'm leaving that out because it gets very complicated math, but... I've laid this out on my website, by the way. Um, you can basically say, okay, that incremental $100, I just put that into my AAS things. So I've earned back my, gr- my gross margin that I'm accustomed to earning. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of it I can put into these recurring contracts. Mm-hmm. Boom. Right there you've handled your finance problem, and not only that, you've created an incremental value for the company. Can you just real quick like, give us three examples of these that aren't software? Oh, yeah, the coal mining machinery one. Yeah, that would be, that'd be That's the one. first one. Okay. Uh, you, uh, light bulbs would be another one. And? A good example is is I own a bike trainer at home. Uh-huh. And it's mm-hmm. a connected trainer. And it's essentially worthless to me unless I also get the subscription product, which is to actually allow me to monitor my performance while I'm biking on this thing. You mm-hmm. have to pay for that, though. You have to pay for that. That's on the subscription. I mean, you can manually set the resistance, but who wants to do that? You want this on the fly. Oh, because they're giving you, like, dynamic training programs. Yeah, where exactly, exactly. Having more fun yeah. with it. Yeah, I won't say the brand of it because there's a lot of brands out there, and they all basically do the same thing. The hardware itself that you actually attach the bike into is a loss leader. You buy that, they're not making any money on that. What they're making money on is the App Store. When you go to the App Store and buy their app in order to be able to download dynamic programs and different training regimes and stuff like that. 30-minute hit program. Exactly. That's where they're actually making the money. Oh, so, I mean, I think the one that's, like, what's the most famous? Peloton. Peloton works under that business model. Yep. Exactly. Peloton works under that business model, probably. I can't confirm it. Well, no, they offer you streaming classes. They have to. Yeah. Yeah. So, in case people don't know... Uh, Todd and I are real cyclists on actual roads, so we don't own Pelotons. I, I was a real cyclist when I lived in California, and Hong Kong is a little bit challenging, but I try to do as much as I can. Um, but, you know, those are those are good examples. Oh, you know who's really good at this kind of thing is Amazon. Okay, yeah. go into that more. Everybody knows yeah, about Amazon. Amazon. Amazon doesn't make money on their hardware. Oh, you mean like the Fire TV? Fire TV, all that yeah. stuff. They don't make money on that. Yeah. It's sold probably below, I mean, I'm not going to go out on a legal limb here, but it's probably sold below the actual cost to make the product. Why? Because they make all the money back on the content, yeah. which is essentially recurring revenue because you have to buy more content in order to actually enjoy the device. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you're a Prime subscriber. And you notice how much they've shifted everybody over towards Prime. Um, oh, what's how guy? could you have missed it? Yeah, yeah, hundred million yeah. plus subscribers. Yeah, how could you yeah. have missed it? I mean, you look also. Well, I mean, there's other examples. Uh, just this is software, but it's really more of a service. Look at what YouTube is doing nowadays. I am on the verge of subscribing, especially when they hit me. I think that this is a good talk with the family pack, which I just saw the ad. So we're in Hong Kong, so we get products behind. By the way, even yeah. though I I actually have talked with the head of Google here, and that Hong Kong for their size is one of the most profitable markets yep. especially yeah, I'm, youtube i'm subscribed actually. to youtube At, but what got me is that i'm married mm. and that <laughs> uh, i well no and only because i didn't want to subscribe twice right is i was like if i get it my wife's gonna get it and you know not that i can't afford it it would just grate me yeah i think you guys it know, makes you sense. Guys well, know yeah. where i'm going here and, yeah. and then yeah. they hit me literally two days ago for the first time 
opened my phone and they were like, hey, we got a family pack. And now I'm like, bingo. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, you know, we can go deeper into that. I, I remember when I first saw the ads, they kept asking me to subscribe. I was like, no. Even I mean, before they bought Google, actually, you know that they had like a lifetime. Oh, uh, they did? Like a $50 uh, lifetime ad free. No way. Oh, this is like, I mean, like 07, 08. Type oh, of a, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I've always sat there <laughs> being like, man, that was the trade of the century. Yeah, that, that would have worked out <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah, wow. But I missed yeah, out. Yeah, hmm. tangent. Anyway, I mean, some of these other challenges, I mean, you can work around this finance issue by thinking very, if, if you've got your eye on how much the customer is, is getting in terms of incremental value from your new products, your new packages, stuff like that, you compare that against your old price um, when it's just purely hardware, for example, you can always just basically take that incremental value and say, I'm not going to bank that right now, I'll bank it over time in the future. And you put that into the recurring machine and it becomes incredibly valuable. And not just that, I think if we, if we go with the Amazon thing, I'm sure like Apple that they get a cut of revenue when someone subscribes to Netflix on the device. Uh, I'm going to guess probably because it's their real estate. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's exactly they've got the right to, to charge so for who's using the real estate. So that's like um, a transformation of their business model on top of a transformation of yeah, their business yeah, model. Yeah. Of like money printing. But, you know, Apple has done a phenomenal job of monetizing stuff beyond their hardware, too. Um, you know, incredible job. And you, you, we were talking earlier offline that uh, Apple's making more money off the services now than off of the hardware. Mm-hmm. Tremendous achievement for Tim Cook, by the way. Yeah. And you know, I will congratulate them that one of the key And it's guys not like they don't they sell hardware. They sell hardware by the I can't even come up with a uh, uh, oh, yeah, like a crazy. container, yeah, like how a billion containers container a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like like how much hardware are they still mm-hmm. selling at outrageous markup to the production cost? I, I use Android in case you can't tell. Um, but that now on top of making a boatload of cash on that hardware. They are now making even more money on the services. But you know where wow. they you know where they got the expertise? No. They hired away a guy from Adobe. <laughs> so as as a business is moving into this subscription based model, there's a th- this is unexplored territory for a lot of companies. Absolutely. With, with an with an existing transaction flow, existing operations, sales, marketing, et cetera. Uh, what approaches can a company take to navigate this new world and uh, approach it in an agile way. I mean, I think low code helps with that. You're able to, if you're sitting there, you're thinking, this all sounds good. I'm excited. You've got me interested in this business model. I'm just going to take the plunge. You know, you, you want to be able to do a couple of things. One is experiment. And secondly, draw on an expert because it is easy to mess this up. It's easy to mess this up financially. It's also easy to mess it up with your customers in terms of communication, your investors. Uh, Adobe got a hall pass on Creative Cloud. I mean, their, their revenues, their margins both went down pretty substantially after they went to Creative Cloud. Mm-hmm. How did their stock Whoa. price continue to shoot up? Oh, no, no, it came out of that. No, I know that, but I didn't know yeah. that they took, oh, no, no. Big yeah, it took a big hit. Death Valley. Every company that makes a transition from Perpetual to XAS goes through what I call Death Valley. It's at least two to three years. Whoa. And no, but here's the punchline. You come out of it, and now everything is recurring and running well. Your margins start improving like crazy. And your market has expanded radically. Your market's expanded. It costs you a lot less money to hold on to these customers because it's always cheaper to keep a customer than to buy a new one. And And to get kind of finance geeky here, when you have predictable ongoing revenue, it's cheaper for other people to finance you. Absolutely. In terms of selling your what your equity is worth, how much it costs to issue your debt, because you have finances that are like, you know, predictable. I mean, it's just rock solid. We yeah. know how much money we're going to make now. We know how much money we're going to make future, and we will pay back this bond, or we'll be worth this much on this date. Like, yeah. man, yeah, it's just it's totally predictable. I mean, it, it's very nice and smooth, and everything just keeps going up. But that Death Valley is actually challenging. Adobe did something I thought was really great. And, uh, you know, this is one of the great things about being there at that time. Um, Adobe's management team went to all the analysts, all the critical people with Wall Street, everything, and said, hey, guys, guess what? This is coming. We're going to see a significant um, retraction in our revenues. Our margins are going to go down. 
um, for the next two to three years. And then we expect them to go up as we transition to this model. And we were very open, showed, you know, everything legally that we should be showing. And Wall Street loved it. <laughs> Our mm-hmm. stock price went way up. Who did they think you were at the time? Were they looking at Salesforce or? Well, no. When, when we started on Creative Cloud, they looked at us and they said, we don't know what you are. Oh, because this was, I mean, yeah, SaaS, even in 10, oh, we were, we were was a, not a big, is nearly where it is But it wasn't today. even a SaaS yeah. issue. I mean, before we made the transition, we were such a jumbled collection of different businesses. I mean, we had a video conferencing software solution. We had Creative. We had Document. Marketing Cloud. Marketing Cloud yeah. with Omniture. Um, you know, we, we had a bunch of different parts of the business. And um, once we went to Creative Cloud, it became very clear and marketing cloud. Once we had those two things, it was very clear. We were creative and marketing, SAS. Boom, Ooh, done, yeah, finished. That's a value proposition. And we went from having needing a half hour to describe your business to needing two sentences. Mm-hmm. Boom. I mean, that just that made it take off. Now, if you're a company that let's say makes an industrial product or something like that, that's you know it's going to be a tougher thing to go to people and say, now wait a minute, I'm now salesforce.com. I think I'm yeah, right. <laughs> but if you go to them and say, look, I now have a blended revenue flow from hybrid, not competing offers against each other, but a hybrid offer where I sell my hardware. And then on top of that, I sell a suite of different subscription packages. So to, that's probably where the opportunity of people who haven't already transitioned are today. Because yes. I think SaaS is the obvious play for any kind of productivity software to the business. I mean, I can't right. name a single new company that has launched selling software to businesses that isn't SaaS. Yeah. So within the software world, it's pretty yeah, it's done uh, deal. established. They won. But but yeah. outside of software, I think, is, is where things start to get really interesting yeah. with this approach. Uh, because it seems that it's, uh, unlike the software world, people haven't, in mass really come to understand the opportunity that exists here yeah. and, and, and transition their mindset to this. Well, it, though, if you look at it, we, we have some examples of this. So Hewlett Packard, the enterprise side of the business, they announced, I think it was last year or the year before, they said, we're, we're going to go full on with this. 2023, by them, we're going to be all uh, as a service. Uh, John Chambers came out last year, and I, I used to work for Cisco as well. And I can remember when we were very much struggling with how do we create recurring revenue models, which was tough mm-hmm. for the, the kind of company well, A company we that were. makes network appliances. We make network equipment. So, yeah. you know, it was difficult to think about, well, how are you going to get somebody to subscribe to that? Um, there was a way to do it. And Chambers came out and said last year, he said, if I had to do it over again, I would have run Cisco as a subscription company, as an as-a-service company. Mm-hmm. He would have transformed that much earlier because of the value it creates. Um, so, you know, we're seeing this among tech leaders doing this. We've talked earlier about Dollar Shave Club. I mean, it, it is spreading. It's going into more areas. It is scary. Um, first is making sure that you, you trial some things. Creative Cloud was trialed in Australia. English speaking, um, you know, great market, not the hugest market on the planet. Yeah. But, you know, we could try it out there without tanking the whole business. And it worked. And so what did we do? We said, okay, boom, we're going global with this. Um, You know, trial some things. Low code, the theme of the the podcast. I mean, that's where this fits in. It's being able to experiment and experiment quickly. Being able to translate from the business guys that are coming up with these ideas, the guys that can actually implement the IT. And where is this IT? Because it's not always necessarily going to be delivering continuous software updates and doing license checks. For I mean, folks. development of custom software solutions. Well, I mean, what software do you need? Or, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at what you can get off the shelf that's going to help you with subscriptions, I mean, first off, you need some sort of subscription billing backend mm-hmm. and a customer relationship backend, basically monitoring you know, customer activity and stuff like that. There are good ones out there. There's Zora, for example. And you don't mean like a CRM. You mean more of like a data analysis. Data analysis. Yeah. You have Zora. You have Gainsight. Gainsight doesn't do the billing side. They do more of the relationship side. I mean, these things exist out there. That you don't need to build. What no. you're thinking about more is is that I need to learn specifically about what people consume more of, why. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you go back in time, Adobe Systems, 
uh, well, I mean, look at any company. They, they watch their end users actually use their product. Adobe used to have people literally sit over somebody's shoulder and watch them use the product. I mean, you imagine you're sitting there doing your work, and it's like, dude, can I help you? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, could you go away, please? I'm trying to work here. You know, And thinking you're getting good data while the researcher behind you is watching you work. Yeah, it's like, oh, my God. But now what it is is that now that it's online, you can monitor all this stuff. You, you basically create value by seeing how your customer uses your product, where mm-hmm. they're having problems, and then you start automating, understanding. Well, well, we, we're starting to get into the whole area of customer success. So this is where Which I is see it. Which huge, yep. huge, huge, huge. Enormous. Yeah. I mean, it, as I joke, I could write a book about this. In fact, I am writing a book about this. Mm-hmm. And it's basically how you do it. Well, and that when we when we actually when you told me what you wanted to talk about, this was also the part where I personally was like, "Are we consulting? Tell me everything you know." Oh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you everything <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, tell me all uh, of it. Yeah, but you know, basically the idea is again, if you're doing anything as a service, if you're doing anything subscription, all your money is going to be in the renewals. Okay. And this is where it, we were talking earlier about, so what are some of these roadblocks people are going to run into? One is is your sales team. Your sales team is no longer selling. They're now maintaining. Mm-hmm. And that's why you, know, you don't necessarily need to automate all that. You still could have your salespeople, but part of what their new job is is to make sure that the customer ongoing is happy. It's not just to get that big sale. Because you find that the customer acquisition costs, usually a good payback period can be as much as a year. Meaning yeah. you don't make a dime off of the customer until you've had them for at least a year. Renewal costs what generally... What do you mean? Where, where's the cost uh, contribution on that, though? What do you mean? Well, is it's like, was it like the, the physical uh, inputs in the manufacturing process? Or do you mean like oh, no, total no, 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 cost? No. Customer acquisition. So customer acquisition is any cost that is required to bring on board a customer actually using oh, so you your mean product. just sales and marketing costs can take a year to pay back? Well, it, it's sales, it's marketing, it's whether you not only had a free trial, it's any transaction costs. So one of the costs that a lot of people will leave out when they do customer acquisition costs is discounts. Uh-huh. That's, that's not something that you put as an impact on your lifetime customer value. You put that on your customer acquisition costs because otherwise you would have had to spend it someplace else mm-hmm. to, ca- to acquire that customer. So... Good companies, really, really world-class companies, their payback period is three months, meaning that their customer, after they've had the customer for three months, all the acquisition costs have been paid back. You've earned enough gross margin to pay off everything that you had to pay in order to to acquire them. Bad ones, it takes over a year. That's why renewal becomes so absolutely critical. Renewal cost, if you're good, well, sorry, if you're a bad player in this renewal will cost you about a quarter of acquisition so already right there look at that difference and and what kind of data should a company be looking at in order to optimize this renewal <laughs> it's so I, I laugh because when i was at adobe i was at a, a parents party and i ran into the guy at salesforce.com of all things what is he doing he's doing customer success I, and we had just started to look at the topic at Adobe. We, we were joking. When we first launched Creative Cloud, for the first six months of Creative Cloud, the only thing that the download manager on your desktop did was phone home once a month to say, did this customer pay? And so I was like, well, I'm leaving money on the table here. So I'm talking to this guy from Salesforce. I'm like, you guys have got to be the pros at this. I mean, you are the anything-as-a-service pros. Tell me, what information are you gathering about your customers to determine, first off, their propensity to renew, but secondly, their propensity to upsell, mm-hmm. to buy more? And it's a massive opportunity. Massive opportunity. Oh, my gosh. I mean, all the growth you're going to get as a subscription company down the road is going to come from upsell. Think about it. If you've set your price, if you're, sure, 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 sure. If you've set your price at 50 bucks a month for an all-you-can-eat product, how are you going to grow? If you've already penetrated all the customers out there, you're not. It's all going to have to be about having packages to upsell them to. Um, so I was talking to the Salesforce guy, and I said, well, what do you guys measure? He goes, well, look, here are the, some of the things that we are picking up on. The title of the person using the product, how many times a day they log into it and use it. And they've traced that literally back to his user account. Yes. Um, but, you know, that's part of the end-user license agreement. 
um, which you also have with subscription stuff, still called the EULA. Um, then you have also, uh, they, they collected information about what features they used, how long they used them, where they got stuck. And he, he said, we basically get a profile of who the automatic renewal customer is. Right. We have a profile of the in-trouble customer. We have a profile of the, they're gone. And I said, well, how do you analyze all this stuff? And, well, we, we do it in Excel. <laughs> I was thinking, wait a minute, Salesforce, you've got to have all this stuff like massively automated and all this AI, blah, blah. And no, 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 we're using Excel. I mean, you have this gulf in between the business guys that are thinking this through and the IT guys that are actually going to be able to take this and then you know, make it efficient, you know, realize it in IT tools, and, you know, getting us back on topic, low code. This is where low code is beautiful because it, it lowers that barrier in between the IT guys and the business guys and also the cycle between them. Well, and also have how this was a support system, which I think is a – it was a side process to a strategic oh. process. Well, not n- – if, if you all can understand what I'm saying by that is that their core process is renewals, but one of the things we have to do on the side is crunch some data – about customer success, you know, and that are, I'm sure that Salesforce uses Salesforce for their um, renewal tracking and everything like that, but that, you know, trying to uh, build that into the core system was too much, so maybe something like low code can take that auxiliary process and still create a lot of value there. With yeah, automation. because there's, there's as, as Todd's pointing out, there's they're, they're able to predict which customers uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Todd, that, that you're able to predict which customers have signals that they are in higher risk to churn, mm-hmm. and then you're able to better allocate resources about yeah. sales support, you know, staff, in order to, uh, you know, maybe they just need a little bit more training. You know, yes. maybe there's some detail about the product that could be changed a bit to make it really sticky for that customer. Yes. And... Uh, through this whole data analytics uh, feedback loop uh, that you're building, uh, it, it sounds like there's tremendous opportunities there. Tremendous, because I mean, there's y- you did a great job of laying out. There's a variety of different sides to what we're talking about here. One is I get to triage my customers to determine their propensity to renew, mm-hmm. and is that valuable to me? So yes. The dollar value of the account manager. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, basically, what it what it helps me do is is it helps me not spend any money on the people that are lost. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, okay. or who are just so happy, you know. And also those yeah. they're they're just set. I mean, roughly in any cohort of subscribers, you're going to have about sixty percent are so happy they'll auto renew. Either that, or they've just they may may have forgotten. But you know, for them, it's it's a no brainer. They're there. They're staying. Then you have about 10% that you've annoyed them so bad with some, for some reason, you know, a, people always are going to have an issue with some, some portion of your customer base is going to have an issue. You're, they're lost. You're not going to keep them. You've got 30% that are sitting on the fence mm. normally. How did you come up with this 30% number? Uh, research. Okay, I, so I that's just, just the way it is. All <laughs> it's right. just the way it is. I believe Sorry. you. I believe you. I mean, okay. th- this is sort of industry practice, talking to people. What ends up happening is, is that if you're a subscription company that's not particularly good, what do you do? You get to this, you know, you've got a cohort coming through. It's their renewal period. It's month 11. And you're looking at the data, and you've done your 60, 30, 10. So what do they do? They flood the, t- the 30 with spending. Mm-hmm. Well, normally they only keep about a third of that 30. So you've got a cohort. They all signed up in the month of June. Mm-hmm. And you're just looking at the month of June signups, and you're in May of the next year. So these mm-hmm. people are in the process of thinking about renewing. So you're you're thinking about well, what do I do? I've got that thirty percent chunk. Oh, in that's there. what you meant—the allocation. Yeah, right. that thirty percent chunk in there may walk, and for the bad companies out there, they only keep about a third of that thirty. And what do they do? They normally flood the heck out of these people with promotions, which are essentially discounts in different clothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what do they do? They, they've got 90% of their spending gets focused in the form of a discount on trying to save 10% of their subscriber base. Those are horrible economics. Mm-hmm. 
So first is just knowing which is in which group, but the other part is, is making sure they don't end up in the bad groups. How do you do that? It's through customer success, and it is through things like training. A good company like a Salesforce, what are they going to do? They're going to be tracking in the background, oh, you're using this feature. This user is using this feature, which, by the way, is a high-value feature. This is We found out over time this is one of the killer fe- features, one of the killer apps that people absolutely must have when they use our service. And secondly, we found that people that use this feature well tend to to renew. Mm -hmm. Oh, this person's having a problem. Bam, what do you do? You have a pop-up window and says, hey, I noticed you're having a problem. Here's a video that will show you how to use that more effectively. And you want to catch that much earlier than month 11. Day one. Day one. By the way, one of the other things, this I found very interesting. Somebody helped me understand this. Um, One of the things you track is customer service calls. And, you know, somebody... Well, I'll ask you, what's the optimal number of customer service calls for somebody? I mean, people who are new, typically how many customers? Greater than zero, I would guess. The people who make no customer service calls are almost certainly not going to renew. Why? Because they're not using it. (laughs) Right. If you've got one customer service uh, call per quarter, that's the sweet spot. That means they're not mad at you, and it also means they're using the product. Above that, it means they're angry at you. Mm. The sweet spot is one per quarter. Mm. <laughs> I was surprised when I found that out. Mm. But anyway, yeah, so you, you track these things. You make the customer successful, and this is all through the tracking of, of data and things like that. If somebody, if you have a direct relationship with your end user, getting back to one of the fundamental um, benefits of going to this as a service model, well, you're able to get that information. Previously, you could. I mean, think about it. You're in the old days for a software company. They would they put a postcard in that box and say, "Please send this back with your information." You can imagine, you imagine you got the CEO of Microsoft sitting there and Ballmer sitting there going, "Oh God, please send that card back, please, <laughs> please." I mean, that's how trapped they were. Mm-hmm. And now you've got all this stuff. You know, if you're going to cloud, if you're going to things like that, but even if you're just a, a coal mining machinery manufacturer. If you've got these connected apps on top, now you're getting that direct user information. You don't have to go interview people. You're getting it automatically. Oh, that minor jam five times in the last 30 minutes. And it's the ground truth. It's not just what people say. You can see what they're actually doing. Bingo. It's demonstrable data or actionable data. I, I want to jump in here and talk about even some revelations about the nature of what maybe low code is between Josiah and I. It's all this glue and, and like uh, just to can ramble about this super quick here is that um, you were giving the example before about how they were using Excel. Yes. And oh yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah 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 yeah. So it, it's a, it's about being able to systematize that and and then tie that data in. That's it's trapped in Excel. Yes and then, yes yes. And then bringing it out of that trap and then connecting it with all your other tools. Ah. And and something that needs to evolve. Uh, quite a lot over time, where it's not like you have it all figured out perfectly at the beginning and you just go build. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, again, it's, it gets back to the experimentation thing. It, it gets down to getting these cycles down. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when we were talking about tools, when we were talking about the subscriber platform, I mean, examples of ones that are out there, Zora, um, they supported Dollar Shave Club. Uh, you know, they were a major client of theirs. Um, Gainsight is excellent at uh, customer success. They're one of the ones that are available out there. There are many. Um, But one of the things you want is you do want all these things to be able to talk to each other. You want them to be able to interact. You want to be able to get the data out of the silos. You're going to be picking up a bunch of different strands of information about your customer. And by the way, I'm not talking about spying and snooping. I'm talking about knowing and loving your customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's knowing everything about them that helps them be more successful with your product you're going to have some of that information in a customer service database. You're going to have some guy that is or or woman that's analyzing this data, trying to find correlations between certain behaviors and renewal or certain behaviors and consuming more Mm -hmm. or expanding their use of your product. You're going to have uh, information stored elsewhere, which is going to have um, demographic information about your customer unifying all this in one place that that it hurdle by the way is not inconsequential um i know from working in a company you now my the latest company i worked in was n- a big corporate that i worked in was not an it company it was not a technology company we made an industrial product mm-hmm. 
we made it durable. And to start talking to people about the concept of, well, we can have a customer portal where they put in their designs. We keep, we kept their ordering history. They have usernames and this and that. I, people are like, oh, my God, I don't know what you're talking about. And th these are very new concepts. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to prototype this stuff quick, a prototype is essentially internal trial, right? Mm -hmm. If you're able to prototype this and show it to executives and stuff, um, that becomes very much like a trial. And trial is essentially a form of very, very inexpensive marketing. Yeah. And low-code tools are fantastic well, for satisfying that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think another thing where uh, we, we were kind of getting into this is that, you know, low-code, we'd like to also expand the definition, not just to these tools that help you, like, prototype business applications, but also stuff like building automation in your existing tools. Yeah. You know, that is a low code. Does it, are you creating a custom application? No. But are you building in programmatic behavior into an application? Are you programming it? Yes, you are absolutely programming Right, the way that it. all these different subsystems in your company are coordinating together as part of this greater orchestra mm -hmm. of building this recurring revenue business. And... Uh, there's a lot of glue that's required and a lot of uh, evolution that that glue requires to go through over time. And you don't want to use uh, systems here that are brittle and take a lot of time to evolve. Absolutely. You want to go as fast as your business ideas come to you. You want to be ready to adapt and seize that next opportunity. And also there's just the new generation of tools uh, or I should say, uh, you know, stuff like webhooks, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Yep. And even stuff like Zapier makes it, th I, I believe that the level of the citizen developer, which gets brought up a lot in, uh, you know, the low code discussion. I think that the citizen developer for a platform like uh, OutSystems and Power Apps and like a Salesforce user building their like workflows and stuff like that, that's not there. What you're starting to get these days, which is absolutely low-code transformation, is like a tool like Zapier, mm -hmm. where you have a guy who's in marketing ops. And this is an example that uh, I saw recently where when a customer's credit card fails to renew, it posts in Slack. Mm -hmm. And th that means that the account team needs to call that guy up like immediately mm -hmm. and say, hey, you still want to use this product? Like, I mean, and that he, I bet you from idea, okay, so let's say by the time he solidified the idea and said, I need this to happen, that probably took him generously 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. to and do. that could have a huge impact. Massive. Massive impact. impact. Yeah. Because what is a customer service call? Is that a cost? Yeah. What kind of cost? Uh, OPEX, I guess. Sales. Yeah, cost of sales. Oh, cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sales cost. You know why? Yeah. Every customer's, every contact you have with a customer is a sales opportunity. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's why you do things like customer success where you have pop-ups and things like that in, in your software, if you're a software company. Um, th this is why you need an app a lot of times, even if you're a hardware company. It's, it's another touch point. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have that conversation with a customer, having a full profile understanding of that customer, it becomes an opportunity to sell and s upsell because this is an opportunity to convince them of the great things that you have that are at a different price package. You like show but hide a feature saying, oh, you could have yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you know, I, it sounds like I'm, I'm playing sort of Machiavellian games with the customers. I'm not at all. What I'm proposing is basically the more satisfied a customer is, the more you're fulfilling their needs, the more benefits you're giving them, the more they are going to happily pay you. That's why we have premium price products that exist out there yeah. and sell well. Yeah, this is about discovering how to better service the customer in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a Machiavellian scheme. It's really about not at all. understanding them. And, and to do that, we need tools and processes to help us discover that optimal approach faster cheaper lower risk yeah because they've already sunk so much time and money even up to the point before they subscribe and reputation you know telling their boss that we're adopting this new system and then it's failing mm -hmm. and then if you can come in and say that like uh 
you know, you haven't used the email automation tool and that's actually the big sell on this product. Yeah, I mean, how many times have you guys bought something, it's not working for you at all, and you just wish, I wish someone would just contact me. I mean, maybe you don't think about it, but if someone were to contact you and proactively say, you know, how could I help you with well, this? Well, especially exactly. not just like a nonsense yeah. email, especially if it was, I mean, nonsense is in like, hey, would you like to schedule a call for training? Like, no, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so busy. But if they were like, we see that you're having problems setting up the emails, by the way, I know about mm -hmm. the case. I've been into your account and uh, I can see what you've tried to do here and I'd like to help you just get this fixed. Yeah, or, or oh another man. example outside of the software space. Y earlier, you guys were giving an example of, say, uh, these uh, these bike companies, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So because they've created this data loop, right, they could see that someone bought the bike, you know, they, they cycled for a day or two, and they have not cycled again for the last several days. Well, especially if their, like, pulse was out of control <laughs> because they were, like, clearly <laughs> out of shape or something like that. No, no that's like, health monitoring, right? Yeah, yeah. May maybe you should uh, suggest this person some easier. Yeah, yeah. so, so there's yeah. so many opportunities here because you've created this cycle. You can discover that, oh, maybe we should adjust the, the product itself, you know, the, yes, the way that it Yes, it goes back all the way to product development. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, you could really uh, get to the root cause of what is causing the the opposite of customer success. <laughs> what is causing the failure? What is causing the churn? Mm -hmm. You know, it, by the way, that makes me think of an example. When we were talking about the automation and saying, you know, this guy's not using the bicycle. A um, friend of mine back in the Bay Area that I used to bike with, he uh, worked with NetApp. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about one time when um, – he got a phone call from a customer. The customer said, y your guys are here. They're trying to convince me that I've got a server with a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, they they brought a server. They showed up unannounced. They've got a new server with them. They went to pull out the old one and install this one. What's going on here? <laughs> and he said, well, let me check. And he goes, well, your existing server has a fault. It's not working properly. They're here to put the new one in. He goes, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have any problem. I didn't mm. call and tell him this. And he goes, I know you didn't. We found it. Mm. And then he goes, wait a minute. Oh, my God, you guys are right. There's a problem with my server. And they go, yeah, mm. we're here to fix it. Mm. He goes, oh, you guys are lifesavers. You figured <laughs> this out before I did. Yeah. Boom, right there. Think about, yeah. think the about what that customer is going to think in the future. That. He's like, they've got my back. Yep. They're not going to let me fail. Right. I mean, that's They're the kind of story that would make me want to tell all my uh, greater colleagues, you know, in, in my field. Or if it's a consumer product, tell my friends, wow, these guys are amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's where, by the way, one of the other things that I, I do is I, I advise both corporates and startups a lot. Sometimes uh, startups, they're an interesting game. We don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. But one of the things they're always asking me about is marketing. And I tell them, guys, don't be spending a whole lot of money on doing a ton of advertising, your number one most effective tool for marketing is referrals. Mm -hmm. You know, bring a friend, uh, sell two for the price of one, and tell somebody to bring a friend, well, a second customer. Watch their user data and see when they've had a big win and say, hey, I need a referral. And But, but mm -hmm. referrals only come when someone is in love, usually. Well, that's why I said, right? that's exactly. why you, you have look to at the data and you say they had a win. Yeah, so so for uh, companies with, uh, let's say they're a bit younger in their development cycle, um, getting back to this, uh, like where do you put your, where do you put your dollars, right? Um, you know, you have to get to that wow first and uh, mm -hmm. uh, really do a fantastic job for your customer. And again, this is a place where low code is very valuable because it can, you know, you build this data engine. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, this made me think of something that goes back all the way to 1993. So a guy went, a good friend of mine from high school, he goes to work for a credit card company. And his background is this guy studied physics undergrad at Stanford, but he's working for a credit card company. I'm like, what are you doing there? He goes, I am going to bank the unbanked. So... Basically, this company, what they did is they were able to pull information on people without credit scores mm. and pull them together into a consistent assessment of their credit risk without actually having a credit score. They called it getting to know you, getting to love you. 
and getting to know all about you. And it was fantastic. I mean, the amount of data science that went into this back before anybody ever talked about big data or AI or any of this stuff. This was back in 1993, but that's essentially what they were doing. And this guy, this friend of mine, he is now retired. He was an angel investor in pretty much everything mm. that is social. And he owns his own private island in Belize. Mm. Um, this stuff is, it's not that new. These are business fundamentals. But if you think about it, the reason why my friend was able to make so much money off of this is because back then, very, very, very few people had the ability intellectually to pull together these strands and then implement it in IT. With low code, what are we doing? We're, we're essentially now going to make it possible for that connection between the business thinking around this and then the IT execution mm -hmm. around this to just be affordable and fast because that barrier, the, the reason why you needed a physics genius from Stanford yeah. <laughs> to do this kind of thing, that comes way down. Mm -hmm. Todd, uh, I, I think we're all learning so much about, the on one hand, the opportunity that's tremendous and businesses moving to this uh, more recurring, subscription-based customer success model. And you've also talked about how, hey, it's, it's also a perilous path if you do it the wrong way. Uh, there's some big risks here. Um, so, you know, who, what, like what kind of, a? uh, we could see you have a lot of expertise here. Wh what kind of a company, what kind of a pr uh, executive should, should contact you? You know, what kind of, wh where do you come in here? Yeah. yeah. How do you help these people out? How do you help people navigate? I have been pretty fortunate. I've had the opportunity to both work as a strategy consultant and across a broad set of industries, but at a very prestigious company. Yeah. And I would like to think BCG, yeah, um, pretty good company. Um, I've also worked as an equity analyst. I've worked as an independent consultant. I've also worked as a strategy executive in uh, Cisco and in uh, Adobe as well as Philips Lighting. And through that, I've gained both this understanding of these shifts, these opportunities, these these big changes in businesses, but as well, I've actually had to implement them. I actually had to own them, had to go do them. And so it's a combination of both practical and strategic thinking that I can put to, to um, application for any company. What I typically do best at, where I'm really able to help, is those people who, you know, an executive is sitting there thinking, this sounds great, Todd. I love what you've laid out, and I also understand these risks, but what's really going to happen? What, what is going to wake me up at 3 in the morning one night, and I'm going to be shaking going, oh, my gosh, my company is on the line with this one. I need help. Um, I'm going to be able there to answer those questions because I've been through this. Mm -hmm. I've done this. Okay, I've done it both in the software setting and in a hardware setting. And I'm ready to help those companies that want to try to make this shift, that want to try to get into it. They want somebody that can translate buzzwords and avoid them, that can help them figure out, okay, what's the strategic path on this? What is this really going to mean for my company? And how do I do this without messing up what is – you know, a great company. They wouldn't mm -hmm. have gotten to where they are without already being a great company. So who are you usually working with? Usually working with senior executives who are typically the head of a division. And they're looking for a trusted advisor. So somebody who is going to be able to guide them through this process in the background. You know, this is the person you turn to when you've got that tough question saying, I can't see six months down the road. What's going to hit me? I, I will know that for you mm. from having done it. That's I so can valuable. say, this is the problem you're going to run into. Oh, by mm -hmm. the way, here's a tough decision you're going to have to make. Uh, one company I was working with, I said, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you want to price your product for penetration in order to build that platform for offering all these services? Or do you want to make the money off the product itself? You're going to have to make that decision. And by the way, here's how you make that decision. Yeah, because it's not like there's the always guidelines. a yes. It's like right. it's you, know, not you have always to weigh a that. Yes. you got to weigh that. It has, there's pros and cons to it. It, it's, and it's pros and cons of market, of value, of your own company. And one of the challenges is, is when you just look at a company and say, oh, you should be able to just do this. It doesn't work that way. You've got culture. You've got heritage. You've got tradition. You've got an ingrained way of doing business that has worked and been fine-tuned over time. I'm not saying take all that and crumple it up and throw it out. I'm saying here's the new opportunity. 
and let's find that way forward together in a way that works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, I, I truly believe that when we look at this recurring revenue model, when we look at subscriptions, the customers are going to take good offers. They're not going to turn it down just because it's a subscription. But there are going to be cases where it may not work for your company. It may not work for your culture. It may not work for what your unique strengths and capabilities are. First step is just finding that out. And the next step is, is how do we do this without losing the great parts that got us to where we are? Mm. And how do we do this in a way so that the rest of the company is going to come along? And what I'm saying there is, is that right. I work closely with an executive so that they're going to look brilliant in front of the company. All the ugly, tough, <laughs> maybe even stupid questions, I think can ask me. Mm -hmm. I'm there to help. That's what my role is. They don't have to ask this in the group. Mm -hmm. you know. And part of the benefit they'll get out of this as well is, is they'll be able to determine, okay, here's a time when I bring in large IT teams, or here's the point where I need more assistance from another direction or from another group. Um, I'm not going to be able to provide large scale assistance on anything. I'm the advisor. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is, is, hey, here's the point when you bring somebody else in for this. This is where it's right to go to someone else. And yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's a combination of that strategy background as well as that practical background that where I'm able to help people. Amazing. And how could people get in contact with you, Todd? So I have my website for Velotech, uh, worldwideweb.velotechstrategy.com. Link in the description. Link in the description. <laughs> uh, free to go to my LinkedIn. Uh, it's, uh, you know. Link in the description. Link in the description. <laughs> uh, my email right. address is just todd.brian at bellatechstrategy.com. <laughs> Love it. Link in the description. <laughs> there you go. And yeah, those are the places to reach me. Well, Todd, I mean, it's been incredible having you on. Uh, I was absolutely engrossed, to say the least. Um, I'm sure we will have you on in the future. What I'd really like to do is dive into... Uh, a lot of the specifics that you were talking about, like especially the, the customer data thing. Yeah, customer success. Yeah. yeah how, the, Whoa. Yeah, how and do we, how do we optimize that? that? Forever. Yeah. And uh, we could, and it, it's an incredible area because it's not customer service, it's customer success. And uh, this is one of the, the fortunate lessons I got from working at Cisco. We didn't call it customer service at Cisco. We called it customer advocacy. Mm. Find out more about that on the next episode, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, see you next week. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye.